Let's open up our Bibles. And the book of Psalms, um, 55th Psalm, there is a passage in it that I'm going to read to you, which took on a completely different meaning in the past week. And I've been studying the prophets, I've been studying, you know, reading through the Psalms and so forth. I got pulled into this one, and I actually quoted from this two weeks ago, the last time I talked here. And you may remember it. Uh, 55th Psalm, and we're going to start partly through verse 9. You know, the words are anointed, but the numbers aren't. It doesn't really matter where you start in a psalm or in any, any passage of the Bible. Psalm 55, 9. I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls. Iniquity and trouble are also in the midst of it. Destruction is in the midst. Oppression and deceit do not depart from its streets. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, that I could hide from him. But it was you, a man, my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. Let death seize them. Let them go alive into hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. For there were many against me. God will hear and afflict them, even he who abides from of old. Selah. Because they do not change, therefore they do not fear God. He has put forth his hands against those who were at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O oh God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days but I will trust in you. The reason why this took on a new meaning to me in the past week was we had these incidents, one in saint jean sur richelieu Quebec, and the other in Ottawa, where soldiers were killed by someone who basically flipped out. And when you read about them, yeah, you're going to see the people who are going to say, ah, oh, yeah, I always knew there was something wrong with that guy. But also... People describe them at some point as being the guy across the street, the guy next door. And you see that time and again. He was just the guy next door. She was just a person we knew. And you think you're at peace with them. And then something happens and they turn. And so I, I read this and I see it is not an enemy who reproaches me, but it was you, a man, my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. This is not to make us suspicious of our neighbor or suspicious of the guy next to us. But it's to understand that things can happen. The devil can get into people. Something can go wrong. Something can go sideways in somebody else's mind. But it is God that we can trust in. Through all things, it is God that we trust in. And if we try putting our trust in somebody or making a peace treaty with somebody, it could, there's always a chance it's going to go sideways. But with God, you know what you're getting. And it's always going to be good. So it's a reminder, when you see all these things going down, and you get surprised, because we're going to be surprised by a lot of things happening, you're going to be surprised by somebody that you thought you knew. Understand that it's God that we can trust in. And it's God who will hear us. And that's what we're going to today, is how does God hear us? We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, because so we're talking about Thanksgiving. We're talking about the giving of thanks and the timing of giving thanks. Because what Jesus did when he turned the loaves and fishes into a major banquet, was he thanked God 
before we actually saw anything. So you couldn't really see what he was thanking God for. He didn't say, thank you that you're feeding everybody. He just said, thank you. And when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, thank you, Father, that you hear my voice. And Jonah, when he was in the big fish, he was down at the bottom of the sea, in the middle of the fish, and his prayer was, God heard my voice and rescued me. And at that point in time, Jonah was still in the, way, in the fish, you know? So he was thanking God in the past tense for doing something that we hadn't actually manifested, okay? So giving thanks to God at any time for anything is the way to go with God. But the thing is that they said, thank you that you hear my voice. So how do you know if God is hearing your voice? What do you have to do for God to hear your voice? And that's a funny question, because God knows our hearts and our minds. Mm -hmm. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we're going to do. He's got everything all planned out. So why do we say, thank you that you hear me? Is there a possibility God will not hear you? Yes, there is. And it's, but it's better to think of the, pos of, of, of the way to make, to, for, to, to make sure that God will hear you. So that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, does he hear us? Because David says here, in, in Psalm 55, 16, he says, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Now, we know how we hear God's voice. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. How do you get to know somebody's voice? <clears throat> By listening to them. By being in relationship with them. You know, um, if Janet were to phone me, I would know her voice. Because I've known her for so many years. If, say, Hank were to phone me, <laughs> um, it, might, it, it, would, it would take me a second. I, he would probably have to say, hi, Drew, it's Hank from the mission. Oh, hi, Hank. Okay, then I would recognize, okay? Then I would understand. Because... I don't talk, to, I, you know, Hank and I don't talk that much, so I don't know his voice. So how do you get to know God's voice? He's given us the means to do it. You say in the Word, you, st you, st you start reading Him. You start hearing, okay, what would He say? Then if you start to get an idea that you think might be from God, this is the litmus test. Does it line up with Scripture? But it comes from reading His Word. And you know what? He's given us his word for exactly that purpose, so that we will know what to do, what he expects of us, and you know that nothing that he says to us today is going to contradict what he said in this word here. So that's how you get to know his voice. In the same way, that's how God gets to listen to us, because we're talking to him. We're speaking to him. We're reading. We're praying. We're asking him, what's this about? You get hung up on a passage in the Bible, you can say, Lord, what's this about? And then it comes to the crunch. And when things start going wrong in your life and you need a lifeline to get out of it, now you can hit your knees and say, Lord, help me in this time of trouble. And you'll hear you. It's, it's simple. I know it's not easy, but it's simple. Get to know him. And the reason why I say it's not easy is because since we don't actually see a flesh and blood God in front of us, sometimes you start to wonder, is he really there? Sometimes you start to wonder, am I really listening to him? Sometimes you, you, you wonder if he ever exists. So you have to remind yourself at that point the things he has done in the past. And that's what you give thanks for, is what he has done so far, as well as what he is about to do. Even if you give thanks for the fact that he sent his son to the cross. So he, um, you see, it is possible for God not to hear you. In the book of Micah, chapter 3, right at the beginning, it says, Hear now, O heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice, you who hate good and love evil? We'll skip down to verse 4. 
Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. Oh, hello. They will cry to the Lord, he will not hear them. Who will cry to the Lord? Those who hate good and love evil. So if you suddenly hate good, suddenly, if you're the kind of person who hates good and loves evil, well, then God's not going to hear you. You know, you could be going along, doing your thing, you know, saying, okay, if it feels good, do it. You know, that was, remember that was the mantra of the 70s? I just dated myself, I know. But if it feels good, do it. So you go ahead and you do it. You figure, okay, it must be good for me, so therefore it must be good. Well, God's not going to pay a whole lot of attention to you because you're not walking in his way. And his way is the way of love. His way is the way of reaching out to others. His way is the way of everybody else first and me last. How many times have I gone over that one? You know, that's how you ensure that God hears your voice. Because you're walking in the way of love. You're walking in obedience to him. Here's the rest of it. Of um, verse 4. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, because they have been evil in their deeds. You know someone who really experienced what happens when God doesn't hear you? Jesus. When he was on the cross, what did he cry out just before he died? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And part of that is he's quoting Psalm 22, which prophesied the whole scene of the crucifixion and prophesied the worship of Jesus and of God in the millennia to come. But on the other hand, it was a legitimate question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And why had he forsaken you? It wasn't, a, it wasn't any kind of, you know, oy vey, I'm, I'm, I'm going down, God, where are you? It was that question which had an answer. Why had God forsaken Jesus at that moment? Because Jesus had taken on his shoulders the sin of the world, the suffering of the world, the evil in the world, everything he had taken with him, and he had taken that to the cross, and that was so big, God couldn't look at it. And so he hid his face, just as it says in Micah. He will hide his face from them at that time because they had been evil in their deeds. At that moment... Jesus had become evil for our sakes. In other words, he made it so that God wouldn't hear him so that we would have a way that he would always hear us. See? You want to talk about what to thank God for? If you run out of things to thank God for, go back to the cross Go back to the fact that God loves us so much that he will go to ultimate lengths to bring us close to him. And that was by sacrificing his son. The blood of his son draws us closer to God. Because God can't look on sin. He can't look on evil. And as we repent, because we are essentially evil, as Jesus puts it, as we repent and draw closer to God, that's where he grants us the grace to pull us closer to him. As it's written, draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. You've got to remember this. Jesus says, Matthew 7, 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What does Paul say about all the different things he could do in the name of Christ? You know? He says, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, it's nothing. And he goes through all the different spiritual gifts you could exercise, the healings and the knowledge and the wisdom and all that stuff that you could exercise for, with God. But if you're not doing it from love, it ain't worth a hoot. And that's, that's what Jesus is trying to tell us there too. If, unless you're walking in love, forget about the rest of it. Forget about all the gifts and so forth. 
Because that's not what this is about. It's about loving one another. It's about loving God. It's about relationship with God. And that is how you know that God will hear you. Come with me to, um, back to the Psalms here, because the Psalms are full of these solutions to God being on your side, or making sure that God will be on your side. Psalm 91. And this will give you exactly the reason why God listens to people. Right near the end, verse 14, he says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's establish once and for all what God wants every one of us in this room. He wants long life. He wants health. He wants prosperity, that we prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. He wants salvation for every one of us. Ultimately, he wants us all to join him in the kingdom of heaven. That is written, that is in here, there is no question about that. We all come along at different stages. Every one of us is at a different stage in the walk. If it doesn't look right for you right at this instant, don't worry about it. Stay on that path, and it will come right for you. For some people, it doesn't happen until their last breath. For some people, it happens early on. Somewhere along the line, it happens in the middle for most people. As they go through experiences, and ups and downs, and slips, and stumbles, and falls, and they get back up again. Or, better yet, they reach up and let God reach down and pull him up. Because when they call out to him, when they repent, even repenting, and repenting means having genuine remorse for what you have done and committing that you're not going to do it again. Okay, God comes along. He's given us, he's given us laws. People think that the Bible is a book of rules about how to live. In a way, it is. But the funny thing is, only Jesus Christ could live by all the rules that God gave. And he kind of rejected that law because he just wanted us to love one another and to love God. So what I'm saying is the rules are there and God kind of knew that we didn't have a hope of following them. That's what I mean when I say sometimes that we were created with a factory defect. Our inability to follow God's will on our own. It's obedience and strength through Jesus Christ that saves us. That's what God gave us. That's what he gave his son for. He gave us like 4,000 years to figure out that we were powerless to follow all the laws number one that God had given and number two that the Pharisees had come up with. Or not the Pharisees, but the, but the religious leaders. They weren't necessarily all Pharisees. So we had 4,000 years to figure out that we couldn't do it on our own. Then he sends Jesus. And that's the breakthrough point. The breakthrough point for all of us. We can't do it. We can't pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Sorry, folks, it doesn't work. And anybody who says you should be able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps is lying, number one. Number two is giving a guilt trip to you because you then get down on yourself because you think that you should be able to be strong enough to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And number three, that person is denying the power of the cross. And who, you know, who denies the power of the cross? The Antichrist. So don't listen to those lies. Listen to the truth that's in here. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And all of that is wrapped up in here. You don't have to worry about you know, what not to do anymore. When I say repent of your sins, yeah, it means you're, 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 you're remorseful for what you've done in the past. You focus on God. He will show you the way to live as opposed to the things not to do. Okay? It's not a mess of don'ts. It's a mess of what to do because what to do is focus on Jesus. The thing to do is to love one another. The thing to do is to be selfless as you go through your life. 
and understand that the blessings that come upon you, because being selfless is being going about in sackcloth and ashes and saying, you know, what a poor person you are because Jesus made himself poor. You've probably heard that one somewhere around. That's not what it means. Being selfless means the blessings you receive, you pass on to others. Think of what God told Abraham. I will bless you that you will be a blessing. That's the way we need to look. That's the way we need to walk in our lives. Blessed to be a blessing. Whether it's a, you know, it doesn't have to be with money. In fact, it usually isn't with money. Money is usually a way of fobbing somebody off. You know? Here, here's a, here's, a, here's a 10 spot, now don't bother me. But, hey, I'm with you, pal. I'll pray for you, I'll walk with you. You need to talk, I'm here. That's being selfless. That's giving of yourself. That's blessing somebody because you're giving something of you. And that's what God needs. That's what we need to see more of in our world. You catch on to that, and you will have so much above people in the British properties, people in Kitsilano, people you know, who seem to have it in bags, but they're just as lost as anybody else. But you grab onto that, and you will no longer be lost. Because now you love something that is worth so much more. You will have God's blessing here, God's blessing in the next world, and you will have God's ear. Because now, he will hear you when you call to him. When you run into trouble, when you run into problems, it will happen. It is written. Psalm 34 tells us that the righteous will still see many troubles, but God will deliver them. You know, it's not all going to be jam, even after you come to Christ. But what it is going to be is you now have a way of getting strong and getting pulled out of it that others don't have. So it's important and the sooner the better, the sooner you can get deeper and deeper into the Word. And it doesn't matter if you can quote scripture, book, chapter, and verse and things at a moment's notice. It still is a good idea to dive back into it. Billy Graham, I understand, has read the Bible all the way through 10,000 times. I mean, that must be one heck of a daily plan he's got. But the fact is, even Billy Graham knows he needs to stay in the Word. He needs to reread it. And, you know, I, I think I'm like 9,997 9, behind him, okay? I'm working on reducing it to 9,996. And every time I hit a passage, and I'll look at something, I'll look at, say, you know, the Psalms, or I'll look at even something in the Gospels that I thought I knew backwards. Sometimes I act that way. And something will come up that I've never seen before. How many times have you read a novel and seen something that you hadn't seen before? Not, not often, right? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. But the, you, so you, you've seen it. You know the passage is coming. It doesn't change. The Bible, it does. I mean, the Word doesn't change. The, the, the Spirit doesn't change. But you will see something new. And it will come out and say something to you that speaks right into it. Just as it did when I was reading Psalm 55 on a completely different issue. Well, the, the issue was I was reading Psalm 55 and getting ready for, bless you, and getting ready for talking about how does God hear my voice. And yet I'm reading Psalm 55 and boom, I'm seeing all this about people who you thought you knew and that you had made peace with who turn on you. Okay? So that starts opening up something else. And chances are I will go back in a year from now and read Psalm 55 again and something else will leap out. So there's another really good reason for staying in close contact with God through his word. And, it's, and I should point out that we have lots of copies of Bibles here. So, so like, like, take one. <laughs> Quick, quick, quick digression before I get to this, this denouement here. Um, at my home church, West Point, several months ago, this, this couple came and they were quite interested. They were sort of visiting us and they wanted to know if we had an extra Bible that we could loan them. And, and unfortunately, it was only a loaner, but I, I brought it to them and I, and I said, I do need to, to ask, ask you for it back afterwards because it's one of the few we've got here. And um, the wife said, well, you know, 
we, we do some volunteer work at such and such a place. And she said, but you know, people there steal the Bibles. I thought, and the problem with that is what? <laughs> You know, yeah, steal the Bible. I had a Bible stolen from me in Surrey years ago, and I'm thinking, yeah, read it too. Well, yeah, don't just roll it up or whatever, but read it. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I came down here 10 years ago intending to get Bibles in the hands of people, and that was a, that was a really good start. I mean, it wasn't Surrey, it wasn't here. Never had anything stolen from me here, come to think of it. Don't start. <laughs> I, I, I'm very proud of being able to tell people that in 10 years of ministering down here, I have had one scratch on my car, and that was accidental. You know? So, so God protects, but also he's, he's... People here do not live down to expectations. Put it to you that way. Okay. Here's what I'm going to read to you. From the book of Joshua, chapter 1. I should read this to you. Wouldn't you know what I can't find it right off the bat? But they're about, they've all massed at the other side of Jordan. And they're all getting set to go. They're going to walk in, they're going to take the promised land. Or they're getting ready to go. And the Lord says to Joshua, in three days, prepare yourselves, in three days you're going in. Now think about this. He's giving them three days notice. They'd be wandering the wilderness for 40 years. You would think they would maybe have a couple of toothbrushes set aside, like, you know, for the time when they get the go code to go in there. But no, 40 years, and now he says, three days notice. And maybe some of them were prepared. Certainly Joshua was, was been ready to go for years. Same with Caleb. The others, I don't know. But they had three days to prepare. We're seeing the signs now of Jesus coming back. We're seeing the wars, we're seeing the terrorism, we're seeing the environmental destruction, we're seeing strange diseases coming up that no one seems to have an answer for. We're seeing fear running rampant, whether it's fear of terrorism, fear of disease, fear of debt, whatever. Open the paper anytime, there'll be something that suggests there is something new to be afraid of. We're seeing earthquakes in diverse places, storms are becoming, it's all this stuff that's been predicted as coming before the return of Jesus Christ. We have had 2,000 years to prepare for it. We're getting the signs now. We ain't going to get any three days notice when the Son of Man comes down on a cloud the way he says it will, and quite frankly, if he says in here that's what it's going to look like, that's what it's going to look like. There's nothing metaphorical about that as far as I'm concerned. But we will know when we see it. The fact is, we won't get three days' notice. Jesus says, woe to him who is on the housetop. Woe to the person who is in the field. Woe to the, the pregnant woman. Whoever it is who, for whatever reason, cannot drop everything and follow what's supposed to happen. So we need to know that. And that's why it is so vitally important that we stay in conversation with God through his word, through reading, through prayer, through meditation. You don't have to do it for eight hours a day. Take a few minutes. You know, Jesus says, could you not pray for an hour? Doesn't even have to be an hour. But take some time to get to know God, to get to know His voice, and to ensure that He hears you. Because we're going to be coming down to some serious trouble coming along if you haven't seen it already. Jesus says it's just the beginning of sorrows, and there's some things we haven't seen yet. So things are coming down, and this is why it's so vitally important to get into the Word and to strengthen your relationship with God. He gave us this. He sent us His Son to ensure that we can do that. He makes it easy. It's not going to be a surprise. So take with that and run with it and learn how God can hear your voice in a time of trouble. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you that you have loved us so much and want such good for all of us that you are making it so simple for us to come to you, for us to draw closer to you, for us to build a relationship with you. Thank you that that sacrifice 
The blood of goats, the fat of rams is not what you want out of us. What you want is thanksgiving and love, humility, obedience. <clears throat> Help us to know that as we are obedient to you, as we draw closer to you, you will be with us in a time of trouble. Thank you that you've given us this revelation. Give us the courage and the strength to spread that revelation to others, that others will know it, that others will be blessed by the knowledge that you have blessed us with. We thank you. The mighty and all-powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.